Welcome back. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce my next guest of the luck on Sunday Studio. Um, his life and career in racing has been an extraordinary one. Growing up in a mining family just outside Barnsley, he applied for his first job right out of the newspaper at a very tender age to go and work for a permit holder miles away from home and there began a, a, a story and a career of multiple twists and turns which we will talk about in a few moments time ultimately he has now trained 850 odd winners he is closing in on his first ever century in a calendar year and he's been champion all weather trainer no fewer than five times. He is, of course, Mick Appleby. Mick, great to have you with us. Good morning. It's been, um, it's been quite a journey, hasn't it? It does, yes. Yeah. Seems a very long journey. But it's an awful lot crammed into a, to a relatively short space of time. Where did, the, where did the interest in horses first start? Was there an interest in horses? when? Well, originally, originally it started with my granddad. He was well into his racing and I used to go racing with him to the Doncaster. Or a sort of local track at the time, um, and like when I left school, I, I was sort of tiny, with with seven stone, and he said, "Oh, why don't you go and be a jockey?" And I'd never sat on a horse or even touched an horse at that time. Did that Did that appeal to you? Did you think, "Oh, come on, Granddad, you're you're mad," or, or did you think, "Oh, yeah, all right." I thought, "Yeah, why, why not? Give it a go. <laughs> what else am I going to do?" <laughs> what was life like for you then? Because you you grew up sort of late 70s, early 80s, it was a, a tough time. You're from a, a mining village. Was it as was it as hard as, as I would imagine it to have been? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was. It was hard, hard life there. Um, I mean, it's, it's changed a lot there now. Uh, you have to get the coal delivered on, on the side of the road. You have to go and get the coal in with the wheelbarrows. Um, it was a good life there. We had good fun. A lot of friends. Um, but, yeah, I mean... It, uh, wasn't a bad upbringing at all. So it was it was good in the sense that it was strong family, strong community. You you felt you felt a, a sense of self and a, a sense of your roots. Yeah, exactly. And, and I had to work for everything. Like um, I had sort of two paper rounds. I had a, um, I used to do um, glass collecting at one of the local pubs at night. So I had to sort of work for your work for your money. Tell me a little bit about your your family. Yeah, so me, um, sadly my father passed away this year. Um, he was living in Benidorm at the time. Um, he moved to Spain oh, about 20 years ago to a beefer. He had a bar there. So we used to have some free holidays in a beefer. <laughs> um, but yeah, he sadly passed away this year. Uh, then me, my mum, she still lives up in Yorkshire. And um, I've got two sisters and a brother. And they all still live there as well. And do they all follow what you've done very closely? Are you still very close to them all? Yeah, I'm still close to them all, yeah. Yeah, so they all sort of follow them um, and they come down and see us quite regular and go to the races. So you apply for a, a job out of nowhere at, at, on your granddad's suggestion at, what, 16? Yeah, I was, uh, well, I left school at 15. I was 15. Um, I just got the all sound, looked through the jobs and... Uh, there were a permit holder looking for a working pupil, Mrs. Pilkington, at Stow on the World. So I just rang her up. She said, what experience you got? I said, none. She said, that'll do, come down. <laughs> <laughs> and she must have known she'd have someone who was keen and would work hard yeah. and would basically do anything. Yes, yeah. And that was you. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was hard, hard to start with. Um, I mean, I learned to ride on an old horse called Willie Wumpkins. Really? Yes. He um, won the Joe Cole, I think, three times. Yeah. So he was my schoolmaster. Not a bad schoolmaster, no. multiple children. <laughs> yeah, what yes, was he like yeah. as a schoolmaster? I, I used to fall off him every day. He used to be <laughs> chasing around the field <laughs> every day. But no, I mean, he, he learned me to ride. He learned me how to stay on. Um, no, he was a good grounding. What was Mrs Pilkington like? Very tough. Very tough. Uh, I mean, he was good grounding though. I mean, she was she was very tough. Um, Can you paint a picture of her for me? I'm trying to imagine her in my mind and what she was like. A little old woman with a big roar. <laughs> <laughs> were you were you quite terrified of her? Yes, <laughs> very. <laughs> oh yeah, if you if you're one minute late in the morning, you knew about it. What did you learn from her? Are there still things to this day that you would have learnt from from all the way back then? Um. 
Well, I, I mainly just learned to ride there. Uh, I mean, like she taught me all, uh, taught me all the sort of ground work and sort of grooming horses and everything like that, mucking out. Uh, I mean, certainly, had, I mean, she, she was a small outfit. She bred a few herself and she had about 10 horses there. So that's where, that's where it started. At what point did you actually entertain the idea that you could be a jockey, that you could get a licence and you could do this, that you were any good? Um, well, I never probably did think that, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Um, to be fair, once I'd sort of got into the racing, I never really wanted to ride. I never wanted to be a jockey, really. I was always more interested in the training side. Why was that? I don't know, it just appealed to me more. Um, I don't like falling off and breaking bones. <laughs> but you put yourself through it. You put yourself through the yes. through the ringer, really, didn't you? Yeah. In terms of in terms of a riding career. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I had a good master in Johnny Manners. Now I, <laughs> I knew John Manners a little bit, and yes. um, and you were there with with some some characters, Gary Brown being, yes. being one of them. Yeah. Um, tell me tell me about life with John Manners, who was one of the most colourful permit holders, come trainers there <laughs> there ever was. Oh yeah, it was certainly entertaining. And no day, no days was the same. Um, I remember I originally got the job with him. Uh, he was advertising for a conditional jockey. I'd, I'd just literally got my license out with Basil Richmond because mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a horse there that one of the owners wanted me to ride. So I got my license, and then Johnny was advertising for a conditional jockey. So I rang him up about the job. Um, he said, "I'll oh, come down and see me," and then. And then um, I saw in the paper he'd got one um, in the conditional jockeys race at Nottingham and they had the jump race in there. Yeah. I just rang him up and said, um, have you got a jockey for that horse? And he said, no, you can ride it, lad. He says, if you win on it, the job's yours. And I went and won on it. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on it, was that a good thing or a bad well, thing? I don't know. I think you were a good thing. I had some good times there. Well, you say no two days were alike. Was it... as was it as mad as I imagine it to have been? I mean, he was known as Mad Manners, oh, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah, he was mad as that. But, he, but to be fair to him, he was very good horses and very good. I used to go to the sales room at Ascot Sales. He never, ever used to go down the stables looking at horses. He'd just sit in the ring, <laughs> see one lead, like the look of him, buy it. <laughs> and pay a grand for it yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, it was entertaining there. I mean, like, you never knew what horses were going to be in what stable in the mornings. <laughs> Because he used to go out sort of at midnight, ride, ride around his farm in pitch black, and then let all the horses out of the stables. You'd find them everywhere in the morning. <laughs> 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 did it? Did it sort of make you think differently about actually what you could do with horses? I mean, obviously you wouldn't use it as a template. No. <laughs> You're not going to let all your lovely, lovely no. horses out of your stables and then yeah. get them in the next morning. But did it make you think differently just about? actually what you really need to do yeah i think i, I think the difference with these horses were very tough because there, was, there wasn't molly coddled um and there were his horses well they had to be tough to survive there uh, i mean he, he was very good with the horses but like i say he he, he was hard on him probably but um so they had a good ground in there and so you're in your what in your early 20s early mid 20s at the time yeah it'd be, yeah I think I went there when I was 24. And were they good times? Do, yeah, you, do you look back on that fondly, that period? Yeah, yeah, it was a very good time in my life. Yeah, I mean, we just used to have really good fun. I mean, you never looked at it as a job. Um, it was just good fun, and good times. And I suppose there comes a point where you think, right, I need the next notch up here. I need to, I need to push on. Mm. I need to get to yes. the, next, the next place. Where was the next, where was the next place? What was the next step? So from from John, I mean, I, obviously I rode I rode for a few seasons and rode a few winners there. Um, and then I, I was starting to struggle a bit with my weight, so I thought, well, I'll move on to the next stage now and go and try and get a, a lads job in a sort of bigger yard. So then I moved on to Roger Curtis in Lambourne, and then started training yourself. Yeah, I, mo I moved there and I started training a few point pointers. And did you do it well? Did you think you were doing it? No. Doing it? <laughs> no. Um, I think I was. I was struggling. I mean, I I was struggling a bit at the time with what horses I had. I mean, 
it wasn't very good. I had a really a nice horse called Daringly, which um, I bought off Johnny actually. Um, I, I opened it, was going to give it to me. It had broken down, and he said, "No, no, you got to give me two hundred quid for it." <laughs> so he made he said, you pay him two hundred quid. He says, "Give me two hundred quid, or I'm shooting it." <laughs> so, <laughs> so you saved Daringly. Yeah. And won a few races with him. Yeah, I won a few races with him. Yeah, yeah. So, he, um, so I ran him under Roger Curtis, the red lad there. So I took him to Rogers and. I've uh, trained him myself in my own time. And what was the point where you sort of wanted out of the game altogether? Because you, you left, didn't you? You left, yeah, did, you left yes, the sport yeah, altogether yeah. and you, you weren't in a good place with your mental health. Yeah, no, I had a bit of a breakdown and tried to take my own life. Um, and that's why I sort of moved, moved over to Ibiza. Um, so that it was sort of winter time, so we were quiet in Ibiza that time of year. I worked in the bar with my dad. Um, and then I, wa I was going to stay there. I had ne never had any intention of coming back to England. I'm going to stay there and um, stay in the bars. Had you, um, had you always struggled with your, with your mental health? Uh, not really. Not really. Um, it was just sort of a really bad time in my life. Just a, a period of really yeah, yeah. deep unhappiness. Yeah, and I couldn't see no way out of it. And I guess leaving racing meant a certain amount of weight taken off your shoulders in that respect. Did you feel quite stifled by the sport at that time? Yes, I think I did. Um, yeah, I, felt, I don't know, I just felt like there was no one there for me at the time. And like racing had sort of basically turned its back on me, and the people I was working for at the time. Because you were, you were a senior um, head man at Andrew Baldings at the time. Yeah, at the, the time, yes, yeah, at the time. yeah. It's obviously yeah. a different sort of environment from the one that you'd been used to because it's big and... Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, had, um, I had a good time there. But I think things just sort of got on top of me and a few things had happened and they just all, all built up. And I, I didn't really have anybody to talk to there at the time. And because that, has that informed the way you do things now, running a big yard of a lot of horses good sized staff. Have your own experiences told you a little bit about how you want the atmosphere to be, your sort of family environment? Yeah, I think, that? I mean, I'd like to think that any of my staff, if they've got a problem and they're feeling uh, sort of down, that they can come and talk to me. I'm always there. And I mean, try and be fair with them and look after them. I mean, like to try and think we're like just one big family. And so many of us who know you are you know, so grateful that at that pivotal moment when you did try and take your own life that somebody did look out for you and somebody somebody found you. Yes, yeah, exactly, yes, yes. Yeah, I did have a few good friends there and they sort of found me and got me off to hospital and I came down the, around the next morning. Didn't know if I were alive or not. <laughs> what did you feel that next morning? Uh, felt like shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't really know. I mean, I thought, oh, what have I done? And I mean, I think I was relieved that I was still alive. But then um, I got on the phone to my father and so I told him what had happened. And he came over and whisked me off to Ibiza. Tell me a little bit about going to Ibiza with your with your dad. Yeah, well, quite a good time actually. <laughs> 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 was it just what you needed at the time? Yes, it was, yeah. And I think like that time of year in a beef, it's not like all the nightlife is in the summer. So it was pretty quiet. Um, but I got, met a few friends out there and had, had a good time. Was it a good opportunity to reconnect with your dad as well? It was, yeah, because sort of, we had drifted apart a fair bit. Because uh, I mean, my parents, they split it when I was sort of six year old. So and <coughs> my father had moved over there, so we had drifted apart. It sort of makes you wonder what got you back, what got you back to, to the UK and training racehorses, you know, having, having had quite a traumatic ending. Mm. Well, I, was, I, <coughs> I never had any intention of coming back. And then a friend of mine rang me up. She'd started working for this Australian guy down in Sirencester, and he was looking for a private trainer. So she, she just rang me up out of the blue. So 
because I, I used to I used to work with the girl at uh, when I wrote Manners's, mm. and she said um, I was looking for a private trainer. Would you be interested? And you said no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I said no, not at all. <coughs> I said I'm in a beef, and that's where I'm staying. So the drip, 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 <laughs> drip. What got you back? Was it? Was there an allure of the horses? Was there un, was there unfinished business? I, di I didn't miss the horses at the time. Yes, I was. I was start. I mean, I'd had, I probably wore in a beef for about three months, and I'd, I was starting to miss it. But I just, I, I didn't want to go and work for somebody else. Right. I mean, that was the thing. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. So I, I had to. I was coming back to England anyway. So I came back and went to meet this guy down in Sirencester. And he, 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 got, he brought all, he brought like the horses over from Australia. And I went to have a look at them and yeah, I thought, hmm, not a bad setup. We've got some nice horses there. And like there were only going to be 10 horses there to train. So and he offered me a good deal. So I thought, well, I'll give it a go. When did you start enjoying it again? When did you really start enjoying it? When did you think, yeah, this is, I've, this is me now? I think when we had his first runner and it won 125 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. That'll do. <laughs> yeah. Did you fancy him? Yes, we did. I mean, it had been working very well. So, then the next day we had a 50 to 1 winner at uh, Epsom. And so, what, so what we're talking, what, 2009, 10, that sort of time? That would have been, yeah, 2010. Yeah. And we're looking now and it's 800 odd winners. Mm. Later, yeah, two major stable moves. You've now got your own place. You got married this year. You're in a, you're in a you know, fabulous, fabulous spot. Do you look back and think, how on earth has that all happened? Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I do actually. Still, sometimes wake up in the morning, can't believe it. And I said you you got married to your partner Johnny this year. Yeah, and there is an intention, is there not, to take out a joint license? Yes, yes, if he ever finishes his modules. <laughs> Are you giving him a hard time? <laughs> no, no. Um, he's done his first module, so his second one, I think, is in a week's time. And then hopefully he'll do his third one beginning of the next year. And you guys have been together for how long? Um, Ten years now, coming up to 11 years. And uh, to what extent has that enduring partnership and finding that happiness with him made you the the trainer and and guy you are today yeah i mean we we just we work well together i mean obviously we work together live together and we just get on well and a lot has been asked over the years as to as to how you feel as a as a gay man in 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 horse racing and whether you found horse racing a sport that has has welcomed you um because of your sexuality or or not well how do you reflect on that now um I, I, well Personally, I mean, it's never been an issue to me um, when people take me or leave me. Um, I don't think my sexuality should have any influence in that at all. But you don't feel it's a, an environment that, that wouldn't necessarily welcome? Not now. I think, like, probably when I first came into racing, yes, which is a long time ago. Um, but I think things have moved on now. I think people accept people for who they are. And... Will you feel that there's a, an added significance about you and Johnny being the, the, the joint license holders in, in that respect? Yeah, I think mean, people sort of take note of that, yes. Yeah, I think it'd be for the better. And in terms of the, the sort of stable that you're now putting together, we've talked a, a, quite a bit in this programme about people's emphases shifting as time goes on. Do you look at trying to, to build a slightly different stable to the one that you did? four, five, six years ago, or do you just want to carry on doing what you know? I think um, I think the difference now is I'd rather sort of concentrate on quality rather than quantity. I mean, the problem now is very, with the staff staffing situation at the moment, it's very hard to get sort of staff. I mean, we're very lucky we've got a good good team with us. Um, but. Uh, I think once you start getting above 100 horses, it's very hard to get the staff. Mm. I mean, at the moment, we've got sort of 90 horses in. I mean, that's what I'd leave it at. Even probably, possibly drop down to 80 horses. Do you still get the, the same satisfaction out of tinkering away with a pretty ordinary horse as you do from training a really good one? 
Because <clears throat> yeah, you're yeah. very good at it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I do really like getting horses from other yards and sort of improving them. I mean, obviously, it doesn't work with every single horse you get, but uh, I think we do quite well with, with the ones we do get. Does that, does that part of it intrigue you, that you've got this sort of, almost like this blank canvas and you can, you can paint anything on it? Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, you get, you get some horses and you think, well, well obviously, you, you look at the past form and you obviously, if they've not been performing, you've got to change something. And, and do you, in terms of the actual mechanics of your training, is there anything different or unusual about it? No. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you if there was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there isn't a there isn't a Mick Appleby secret, you don't think? No. I mean, the main thing is you've got to be also fit and healthy and happy. I mean, we like we like to try and turn them out. I mean, obviously some horses just go sour. Um, I think you've got to just try and treat them as individuals if you can. And how much of that are you are you sort of you relying on your your instinct because a lot of trainers will say right horses like routine yards run best on routine they run best on organization do you do you agree with that or not i think you, with the organization but i think with with the horses you've got to try and treat each one as an individual um i think like you got to try and get in the heads and know what they want what do you think has been your most notable success and I'm not talking about the highest profile the most money group races which which horse have you taken most satisfaction from turning inside out or making making something out of nothing I think big country well he was a special horse tell me why I just I mean as, as when when I first saw him at the sales I mean obviously the horse watchers had picked him I looked at his form and thought where the hell have they got that from? <laughs> and this is Big Country winning at Pontefract. Um, black and orange colours of the horse watchers. Uh, we know Chris and Martin Dixon very well, yeah. a big part of the horse watchers. We've been big friends of yours over, yeah. the, over the years. And Richard O'Brien and, yeah. and Matt Taylor, I know. Yeah, I am all a lot. I mean, like I said, they've stuck by me and they'd fear for me from the beginning. And having spent a little bit of time with, with them and you, I know how much you trust them, how much faith they they have in you. That relationship must be very important to you. Yeah, it is, yes, yeah. Um, I mean, like, they're, they're very easy people to train for. I mean, they're very good friends as well. Uh, I never get any grief of them, of them. Um, well, Not occasionally much. might. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, yeah, the, no, they're very, they're very good owners to have in the yard. They're very good supporters of the yard. And having, I suppose, those those racing brains as well, helping you get the right horses in the right races and work it that way. That, yeah, that must give you a lot of confidence. Yeah, it, wor it works very well. I mean, like when we go to the sales, they'll have a list of horses and then I'll go and look at them and we've probably scratched probably 75% of them once we've looked at them. Uh, but like there's some horses, you you look at the form of them and think, oh, why have they picked that? <laughs> <laughs> and you just think, and oh. <laughs> yeah. And they're right more often than yeah, they're wrong. Exactly. I mean, like big country. I mean, if you looked at his form, you'd think, why have they picked that? <laughs> he he must have been a big loss. He was. He was a big loss. Yeah. Yeah. Because he'd left the yard and come back again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. That, that was a very good day when we saw. Him. <laughs> but yeah. But then we got him back. Um, but yeah, it was sad to lose him. Mick, you're um, you're approaching. Your first ever hundred in a calendar year. Yes. And you got pretty close <laughs> a couple of times. Yes, yeah, ninety nine for the last two years, and we're on ninety nine again. Uh, I, I I fancy you to do it this time. <laughs> could you do it we, tomorrow? We could do. It'd be, it'd be good to, if we do do it tomorrow. The horse watchers have got a good horse, which would be well fancied. So hopefully, it'd be nice to have the unjust winner for them. Who are they running tomorrow? Uh, Night on Earth at Wolverhampton. Would it be quite special to do it for them? It would, yes, yeah. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be good to have the hundred win and be one of their horses. And if there's a if there's a real overarching burning ambition that drives Mick Appleby, what is it? Uh, to get a Group One winner. And is is there one imminent? Do you think? Uh, possibly, possibly. We've got some nice horses uh, 
You never know. If there's a if there's a, a diamond in the rough there, who might it be? Oh, that'd be telling. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's just you and me. Yeah. It's just you and me together. Yeah. I don't know. We've got, we've got a lot of nice horses. So it'd be hard to pick between them. I mean, Afflil that won at um, Chelmsford the other day, he's, I think he could be something special. Afflil. Mm. Well, we're looking forward to seeing him out again. Another one for the horse watchers. Yes, yeah, another one for the horse watchers. Yeah. I think he's still got a lot more to offer yet. Mick, it's been a, an amazing journey, an amazing story. It's uh, fantastic to see you here, healthy, uh, happy, and yeah. hopefully on the cusp of training many more winners. Thanks so yeah, much for chatting. Thanks a lot. Mick Appleby.